bladder urinary diversion, again, uses a, a larger uh, <clears throat> segment of uh, small bowel, and it basically creates a reservoir where the patients can urinate through, um, uh, through their urethra. Um, some people ask me what a near bladder looks like uh, during surgery. So I put a slide there. If you, if you don't wanna see a picture from uh, inside a surgery, I would just turn away from the screen now uh, and I will just keep it up for 10, 15 seconds. But uh, here's what a near bladder looks like intraoperatively. So this is, um, this is the small bowel opened up, detubularized and kind of sewn together. And this is a studer near bladder, which uh, most, pe most people use, and that's what I use in practice. And this is where the new bladder is kind of folded on itself, and now the ureters are being sewn in uh, into the new bladder. So that's what it looks like uh, during surgery. But let's talk about why somebody would choose a new bladder um, and, um, uh, and why not. So there are, there are trade offs. Um, so, first, one needs to understand that there is a chance of incontinence. I quote patients approximately 10% chance of daytime incontinence. When somebody coughs, sneezes, picks up something heavy, stand up too fast, you can leak some urine and need some uh, <clears throat> need a pad or 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 or, or it depends. Um, you know, hopefully those 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 chances are even less, but you got to sort of use the 10% uh, risk as uh, as the risk to uh, to make your decision. Um, that's daytime. Nighttime is more difficult to, to, uh, to, um, to predict. So in all of us who have their native bladder, uh, what happens is when our bladder fills, when we're sleeping, our sphincter, our muscle that keeps the urine and tightens automatically. That's a spinal reflex. There's basically, our bladder sends a signal to our spinal cord to tighten the sphincter. Um, in patients who have a new bladder, that obviously doesn't happen because there is no signal from the bladder to tighten the sphincter. So about 20% of patients who <clears throat> have new bladders leak at night when they're the deep sleepers um, and they, they are, they're dry during the day, but when they fall asleep, their sphincter loosens up and they don't have the reflex to tighten it and, and they leak at night. It can be a frustrating problem, you know, may require other surgeries or a lot of times people sort of just handle it and, you know, either put a condom catheter or it depends, um, but, you know, it can be frustrating. So that's a risk that one has to incur, you know, sort of understand before go, getting into a new bladder. Hypercontinence is another risk, and um, hypercontinence is where you can, it's the opposite problem. You're, you can't empty your neobladder, and what happens then? Um, you need to catheterize, and you would need to catheterize for the rest of one's life, and sometimes this is the deal breaker about a neobladder, although in men, the risks are 5 to 10%. Uh, in women, they're much higher, uh, 20 to 30%. Um, but sometimes this is, um, th this is um, uh, a little bit of a deal breaker for folks. They just don't want um, uh, to, to, to risk that. Um, so, but also comp perioperative complication. Recovery, you know, this is a bigger surgery. There's, um, you know, there's multiple drains that are coming out of you. You're walking around, you're waiting this, for this bladder to heal. Um, and so for our elderly and frail patients, we usually don't spend too much time discussing this because they're not great candidates. We, you know, we're, 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 we're going, uh, we're trying to get them through one of the biggest operations that we do in surgery and adding another, uh, <clears throat> uh, another layer of complexity in like a neobladder is just not a great idea. Um, so what about if you signed up for a neobladder? Do you always get one? Well, most of the time you do, but there, I tell patients there's three scenarios where you, we may need to walk away from a new bladder during, you know, at, at, uh, um, uh, using a game time decision. So I tell them it's when the urethra, the the um, uh, the urethra has some cancer on it, so it's always very important to um, to um, send a margin, a urethral margin at the time of a, uh, the neobladder surgery and for the pathologist to tell the surgeons that that edge is clean. Because if there is uh, cancer in the urethra, you can't obviously take more urethra because you'll, you'll lose the continence mechanism and you can't sew to the ure you know, you can't leave cancer behind. So that's one, um, uh, <clears throat> one possibility. The other possibility is that 
Um, sometimes when somebody becomes unstable during surgery, something is happening with their heart, with their lungs, it's you know, very, very rare, especially for patients who are uh, good neobladder candidates. But sometimes the anesthesiologist can tell, uh, can tell the surgeon that, hey, when you really need to get this patient off the table and neobladder just takes more time than a, a that, that's a very unusual sort of scenario. The other scenario is where we find more disease. And again, this is a, dis a discussion with you and your surgeon before surgery, but sometimes we decide that if there is frank lymph node positive disease or there is you know, sort of disease that's concerning, then we'll go with a simpler operation in order to recover faster and get to subsequent therapy faster. All right, let's talk a little bit about Indiana pouch. Remember I told you about this right colon, that's what we use. And we um, make a, um, a catheterizable channel that you, ca that you catheterize. Sometimes you can put it in the belly button, but sometimes you turn this around and put the stoma around here. This is a good option for patients whose pelvis is, who don't want a bag, who don't want a, a, an appliance, but whose pelvis has been radiated or they've had, or they have a, you know, sort of, a uh, degree of malignancy where you can't offer them a neobladder and for whom it's very important not to have an appliance. So this is a good diversion. And, and sometimes, you know, we offer it to women who really don't want to self-catheterize because catheterizing for women can be difficult, especially as they lose their dexterity with age. Uh, and as the body ages, it becomes more and more difficult to catheterize uh, the urethra. So um, th this is a diversion sometimes that we use associated with, you know, uh, Quite high complication rates associated with infection risks. So, uh, you know, um, uh, we, you know, I offer it to my patients, but um, this is um, uh, not something we rush to do before really discussing with patients and making sure that they, uh, th this is what they want. Um, so, let's talk about sexual dysfunction. So, um, this is a little bit of a conversation, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but this is a conversation about what needs to be removed from the female pelvis um, uh, when one does a cystectomy. And classically, the so this is uh, the uh, on this picture. This is the woman is facing this way. This is uh, her back, and this is the pubic symphysis. This is the the rectum, and this is the bladder and urethra. Classically, what's removed is the anterior vagina, the anterior wall of the vagina, the uterus, uh, and here are the you know the ovaries and the fallopian tubes are removed uh, are removed as well. So, kind of this is what's called an anterior exoneration. So, what's really become we understand better is that we don't always have to remove all that, especially uh, especially women are active, um, and if, by not removing the uterus, we can prevent some degree of prolapse, which can happen if you, when you remove these pelvic structures. So for some women, we offer, um, you know, depending on the location of their disease, but if there is really no concern for disease that's really abutting the vagina, to really offer a vaginal and, and the uterus sparing cystectomy. Um, and uh, we offer that more and more these days. And um, the... Um, <clears throat> And so, you know, it's a discussion whether to take the ovaries and fallopian tubes, depending on menopausal status, depending on patient's age. And we usually uh, discuss, you know, with uh, the, the, uh, the patient's gynecological colleagues about their opinions regarding that. So um, if it's a vaginal uh, spheric cystectomy, generally sexual function is largely preserved. Even when the anterior vagina is resected, um, there can be some dyspareunia, there can be some pain with intercourse, but usually patients... Um, can still be uh, sexually active. Um, for male patients, um, we remove the prostate, the seminal vesicles, and the bladder. Ejaculations are dry. Um, and these are the nerves. These are the nerves that uh, innervate the, um, um, <clears throat> the uh, corporal bodies of the penis. So the erections are, even if there's nerve sparing cystectomies that are done, um, the erections are quite poor, but sensation is intact, is always intact. And things like an orgasm, that's one on one's brain. So those, uh, the, um, those functions are intact. So people can be intimate, uh, but the erections are poor after cystectomy, generally, not in everybody, but generally. And uh, there are ways to get erections back. There is, you know, um, some, usually the, the oral medications don't work, but there's injections. There's, there's, a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of options for men who are interested to stay sexually active. So um, an important conversation to have with one surgeon. Um, we have, we're running out of time. 
Um, I will rush through these slides a bit because I want to take questions, but open versus robotic cystectomy, what I'll leave you with is, you know, it doesn't matter. Choose a surgeon and that, um, choose a busy surgeon who knows what they're doing and use their preference. So there's been some concerns about robotic cystectomy recently um, where, you know, the robot is this platform where you use, uh, <clears throat> you use this device to sort of give you 3D visualization and uh, degrees of freedom in, in moving the instruments. But there were some concerns after this paper in, in the gynecological surgery with, surgical, with cervical cancer where the results were far inferior with the robotic surgery. And there were, but thankfully in, in urologic oncology, we did, uh, and there was an FDA warning about it, but in urologic surgery, although concerns were raised over the years about recurrence patterns, because you know they're, they're, the belly is insufflated and some of this urine can get aerosolized and there were some different recurrence patterns that we were seeing with robotic surgery versus open surgery. And then the, there were you know, more strictures with robotic surgery. This is a recent report with these newer techniques, but in the experienced hands, we, there were two trials that were now done that, you know, we basically don't see robotics to be an inferior operation. Whether it's a superior operation, it is very, very much debated. And at least right now, there's really no evidence for that. And a lot of us busy robotic surgeons that, you know, I do a lot of robotic surgery, but cystectomy, I still, uh, I, I did it for five years robotically, and I went back to doing it with a, with a classic open incision because I, I do think the onus is on the on robotic cystectomy to show superiority before we totally shift that way. And it really hasn't happened yet here. Um, but um, you know, it's, it's not the driver, it's the car. Choose a surgeon and use their most uh, uh, preferred method. But uh, certainly both procedures are, are considered now the standard of care. And I, I, you know, the recovery, um, is very similar from, from one verse, uh, versus another, especially if the surgeons use small incisions to do the open cystectomy. Um, and it, it really is a little bit of dealer's choice and just use a center and a surgeon that, uh, that you prefer. And like for instance, at Fox Chase, we do both. We do both open and robotic cystectomy. Um, I wanna spend two minutes because this comes up all the time. What about artificial bladder? When are people gonna make a bladder? You know, we've had an artificial heart since 1982, whether there's no artificial bladder. It's not for lack of effort. People have tried. It's just a very difficult uh, problem to tackle. Um, urine encrusts uh, <clears throat> um, these synthetic devices and the connections tend to fail. Um, and people get bad infections with uh, prosthetic devices in the urinary tract. So these are kind of the best data that we have. And there's been really a lack of effort in the space uh, since the 90s. Um, and, you know, with modern materials, I, I think that effort needs to be renewed, but, um, it, you know, something that I'm very interested in, but it's, um, it, it's certainly, th this, this has largely been abandoned. And because it was, aban it was abandoned because tissue engineering was really um, uh, holding much promise. And there was all, all, all these papers that were coming out where we were looking like we were very close, especially in animal models. But then when we did these trials in patients, there were many problems and these bladders just did not take. Um, and this was not a new bladder. This was just trying to make a bladder bigger uh, in, in some of these, uh, in some patients who have, who were born congenitally with non-functioning bladders. Um, there was uh, a company that was started that tried to make a synthetic ileal conduit by using, um, you know, cells from the patient and um, using a scaffold and growing an ileal conduit. And this was Tengion Incorporated that unfortunately went into bankruptcy in 2014. So um, let's stop here because, you know, I can, I can talk a little bit about um, sort of um, how to save the bladder, but that's a larger talk. But what I'll tell you is we're not there either. This is a study that we just published showing that even when we try to save the bladder and it looks very good on cystoscopy, 25% of the time, we actually miss muscle invasive disease. And maybe we'll do another segment on this later because there's a lot to talk about here. Um, 